Hi there. So in this lecture, I'd like to talk about mutual inductance. Now, I highly encourage you to watch the lecture on self-inductance if you haven't already done so before watching this lecture. It makes a better introduction to the subject, and this is a follow-up lecture. So mutual inductance. The magnetic flux through the area enclosed by a circuit sometimes varies with time because of time-varying currents in nearby circuits. And this process is known as mutual induction because it depends upon the uh, interaction of the two circuits. So as an example of this, let's think back to Faraday's original experiment. In his original experiment, he had two coils. We'll call them the primary coil and the secondary coil. The primary coil was hooked to a battery and a switch, and then the secondary coil was concentric with the primary, kind of inside it, as is shown here in the sketch. And then they both surrounded this wooden um, core. This sketch is from Faraday's lab notebook, so it's one of his original experiments here. So then he closed the switch on the battery, and that induced a current in the primary coil. The secondary coil wasn't hooked to the battery. But he noticed that it induced a current in the secondary coil briefly after the switch was closed, and then again when it was opened. So the current went up, and then stopped as the current in the primary coil was steady, and then it went the other direction when he opened the switch. So what he was seeing was mutual induction, right? There was a changing flux through coil two very briefly when he opened and closed the switch. And that changing magnetic flux induced a current in the secondary coil. So that's what he was detecting there, mutual inductance. So here's a little sketch that might be easier to see. In this sketch, you have coil one and coil two. Coil one has number of turns N1 and a current I1. And then coil two has a number of turns N2 and a current I2. They don't have to have the same areas either. As you can see, coil one is a little smaller than coil two. So it's important to understand that the properties of the two um, circuits don't have to be the same at all in order for this to happen. What happens here is that there's a current I1 caused by some external source of EMF, like a battery or maybe a wall socket or something. And then that current I1 has a flux that penetrates through coil two. And if that flux is changing with time, then of course you can induce a current I2 in coil 2. The constant of proportionality to the EMF is going to be known as the mutual inductance, and it's what we're going to solve for today. So here it is. We can find a general expression for the mutual inductance, which we call N usually. Um, and this one, the, let me explain a little bit about the notation. Here I'm calling it M12. So that's the mutual inductance of a coil two with respect to coil one. So in this scenario, coil one is the one that has the current first, and then it creates a magnetic field, which causes a changing flux in coil two. So you have a subscript notation here, one, two, and that means that it's caused by one, and then the current flows through coil two because of one. Okay, so that's the way it goes. So our mutual inductance um, M12 is defined as the number of turns in coil 2, N2, times the flux, phi 1, 2, right? And th this way, the flux is through coil 2 caused by coil 1, right? And then divided by I1. It has to be I1 because I1 is the cause of the magnetic flux, so you're dividing out by that. Now, the mutual inductance depends on the geometry of the circuits and on their orientation with respect to each other and their physical properties, like the number of turns. But it shouldn't depend on the current. That's why we divide out by here in the denominator. All right. So let's go through an example here, and then let's explain the importance of this coefficient, M12. See, this coefficient dictates how much EMF is generated in coil 2. You can see it's a constant of proportionality here. The EMF induced in coil 2 is equal to negative M12 times DI1 dt. So the EMF induced in coil 2 depends upon this coefficient, this mutual inductance, right? If it's a larger mutual inductance, then you'll get more EMF out. And it also depends upon the rate of change of the current in the causing coil, the primary coil here called I1. So if the current in uh, coil 1 is changing faster, then you'll get more EMF. And if the uh, coefficient of mutual inductance, M12, is larger, then you'll get more EMF in coil 2. All right? Okay, so that EMF2 
is also equal to minus n2 d phi 1 2 dt. Okay? So if there's a current in coil 2, then there's a mutual inductance in m2 1. It goes both ways. So you can have um, a cause from coil 2 on coil 1. And if current 2 varies with time, then the EMF induced by coil 2 in coil 1 is EMF1 is equal to minus M21 DI2 DT. All right, so it goes both ways. Now, not only does it go both ways, but M12 equals M21. And you can just call it M if you want. So the mutual inductance in one coil is equal to the mutual inductance in the other coil. Okay? The induced EMFs can then be expressed as EMF1 is equal to minus M DI2 DT and EMF2 is equal to minus M DI1 DT. In mutual induction, the EMF induced in one coil is always proportional to the rate at which the current in the other coil is changing. Let's do an example problem because it's really easier to wrap your head around it with an example. So this is problem 9 in chapter 7 from Purcell and Morin. What we have here in this figure are two solenoids. You have a larger one, which is solenoid 2, and then you have a smaller one, which is solenoid 1, and solenoid 1 is inside of solenoid 2, all right? Now, the, uh, the uh, convention here is that for the radii of the solenoids, they call A, so solenoid 1 has a radius A1, and the lengths they call B, so solenoid 1 has a length B1. And then, of course, the number of turns we call N, so solenoid 1 has N1 turns. And then, of course, solenoid 2 has A1, or A2, B2, and N2, okay? So what this problem asks is to find an approximate formula for the mutual inductance of this setup. Now, looking at this, you might be a little confused. What you've got is a cross-section, a cut-through, and then all the little dots here are supposed to represent the wires for the turns, okay? All right. So the method of solving these types of problems is very similar to the method for solving the self-inductance problems that we showed in the last lecture. So here we go. The steps are, first, you solve for the magnetic field of one of the coils. Either the problem will sort of force that choice on you, right? So either it'll tell you, basically, you have to know this magnetic field to solve it, or you can have a choice. If you have a choice, then you should definitely pick the easier one. In this problem, we do have a choice. So I'm going to solve for the magnetic field from the larger coil and then solve through the flux of that magnetic field from the larger coil through the smaller coil. And that's definitely the easier way to go here, okay? Second, find the flux due to the magnetic field through the second coil. And then third, plug that into the equation M12 is equal to N2 phi 1 2 over I1. Now, if it's easier, then you can flip that. It doesn't have to be this equation, for example. It could be M21 is defined as N1 phi 21 over I2. So just whichever one's easier, okay? All right, so let's solve for the magnetic field of the bigger coil and find the flux through the smaller coil. Like I said, that's going to be the much easier choice. See here, for the smaller coil, if you did that, you could see the magnetic field isn't really uniform. Um, through the larger coil from the smaller coil. It wouldn't be uniform. But if we do the magnetic field for the larger coil, then we can assume that it is pretty uniform where the smaller coil is. So that's definitely going to be easier. So assuming an ideal solenoid would be a much better approximation here. So that's definitely what I'm going to do. Let's find the magnetic field for the bigger solenoid. I can just use the formula that we already know for the magnetic field of a solenoid. And that is that the magnetic field of a, an ideal solenoid is mu naught times the number of turns per unit length times the current. So that's what I've got here. So B2, which is the magnetic field from the larger solenoid, which is coil 2, is equal to mu naught times N2 over B2 times I2. Okay? Now, the second step is to find the flux through one turn of the second coil, right, which here is coil 1, sorry, the flux through that uh, from the magnetic field. Now, I'm assuming a uniform magnetic field through that smaller solenoid because it's close to the central axis and it's not a very large solenoid, so that should be an okay um, scenario. So the flux is the dot product of the magnetic field with the area vector, okay? Now, the area vector and the magnetic field should be parallel to one another. They should both run along the long axis here. 
So I can just write it as the magnetic field times the cross-sectional area of the smaller solenoid. So that's what I'm going to do. So here, phi 2, 1, that's the magnetic flux through coil 1 caused by coil 2, right? That's going to equal to the magnetic field of coil 2, which is mu naught N2 over B2 times I2, times the cross-sectional area of coil 1, which would be pi r squared, and in this case, r is a1. So that's pi times a1 squared. Okay, so that's our flux. Second step, check. Okay, so now we can plug in to our formula for the mutual inductance, okay? Reminding you, phi 2, 1 was equal to mu naught times n2 over b2 times i2 times pi a1 squared. And then we're going to use the formula for the mutual inductance for coil 1 caused by coil 2, okay? So that formula is n21 is equal to n1 times phi 2, 1 over i2. So plugging into that, I get m21 is equal to n1 times mu naught times n2 over b2 times i2 times pi a1 squared divided by i2. So you can see here that what happens is that the current cancels out, okay? As it should, your inductance shouldn't depend upon the current that causes it, it should just depend upon the geometry and the physical properties of the coils. In this way, it's kind of like a capacitance, right? If you remember back to how we did that. So finally, writing the good expression here that I've got for our mutual inductance, that's mu naught times n1 times n2 over b2 times pi a1 squared. So that's going to be our approximate formula. Now it's an approximate formula because I did make a big assumption, and then that was that the magnetic field is uniform through that smaller coil, which might not be true, okay? But it's approximately true, so that's what the problem meant by approximate formula. Now, I realize that there's a lot of subscripts and a lot of numbers here. So if you feel the need to pause the video at any time or go back and review and make sure that you understand exactly what's going on, I highly encourage you to do that. There's also another problem, an example problem in Purcell and Moore in about two nearby coils, and I encourage you to look at that one as well. Okay, I hope you uh, enjoyed that, and I'll see you around.